Hello, and welcome to the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you hear and you haven't done so already, please make sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcatching source. While a good review and rating won't increase our chances of being found or being a featured podcast on a podcatcher like Apple or Spotify, it will potentially help increase the odds of someone who does find the show for the first time thinking that clicking play will be a good time investment for them. And it's something you can even do while you're listening to this episode. On this episode, I'm going to do a quick dive into one of my favorite movies of the 1980s, one that I have not talked about yet on any of the previous 83 episodes. But first, an apology. I know that I said at the end of the Beverly Center Cinemas episode that our next season was going to begin on September 25th. That was my intention at the time, but unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to meet that self-imposed deadline. There are just too many things happening in my life that I do not wish to go into detail about. Suffice it to say that for now, the plan is to do one short, standalone episode every three or four weeks, until such time as my personal calendar clears up and I can resume a more regular schedule. With that said, let's continue to today's movie, the 1986 Alex Cox movie, Sid and Nancy. Born in Bevington, England in 1954, Alex Cox originally planned on becoming a lawyer. Studying as an undergraduate at Oxford University in the early 1970s, but he would leave the esteemed learning institution after becoming disillusioned with the law. In 1977, he would graduate from Bristol University, where he studied radio, television, and film. His time at Bristol would end up securing him a Fulbright scholarship, which allowed him to go to film school at the University of California in Los Angeles. While at UCLA, he would create a 40-minute student thesis film called Edge City, which he would use as the name of his production company after graduating with the intention of producing low-budget feature films. One of those films Edge City would try to get made was a weird sci-fi movie called Repo Man, which Cox thought he'd be able to make guerrilla style on the streets of Los Angeles for just $70,000. But then, the script would make its way into the hands of one-time monkey Michael Nesmith, who was able to get Universal Studios to produce the film with name actors like Emilio Estevez and Harry Dean Stanton on a $1 million budget. I've talked about Alex Cox a few times concerning his 1984 debut, so I'm not going to go into detail about that film here. We all know Rebo Man has become a cult classic since its difficult original theatrical release in 1984, and the relative success of both the movie and its soundtrack would give Cox the ability to dream even bigger for his next film. Sid and Nancy would tell the story of the destructive love affair between Sid Vicious, the bassist of the seminal 1970s British punk band The Sex Pistols, and Nancy Spungen, an American music groupie with a history of psychological problems. Heroin addicts both, Sid and Nancy would form a strange symbiotic relationship that would end with her murder a year and a half after their initial meeting, and his overdose death four months after her passing. But not everyone wanted to see a movie made about Sid and Nancy. Anne Beverly, Sid's mother, considered suing the production, perhaps worried that the film would portray her, as many rumors had about her, as the main supplier of drugs to her son. But after meeting with Alex Cox, she not only decided to help the production, she would give the filmmaker Sid's own heavy metal chain and padlock for the actor playing her son to wear. For Cox, his first choice to play Sid Vicious was a 27-year-old actor, known at the time for his intensity on the stages of the Royal Shakespeare Company, Daniel Day-Lewis. At the time, Day-Lewis had filmed his roles as a young gay Brit in an interracial relationship with a Pakistani man in Stephen Freer's My Beautiful Laundrette, and the upper-class fiancé of Helena Bonham Carter's character in James Ivory's A Room with a View, but neither film had been released in the theaters yet, so he was still rather an unknown to most audiences. But Cox would set his sight on another young London actor who the filmmaker had seen in a stage production of the Edward Bond play The Pope's Wedding. Gary Oldman would turn Cox down when offered the role of Sid Vicious, not once, but twice. Oldman wasn't interested in Vicious or the punk movement, and he wanted to be a stage actor. But the producers would offer Oldman more money to say yes than he had ever earned as an actor before. Oldman would say yes, and he would soon be in front of the cameras for only his second film ever, and his first as a lead. 
Having heard about the movie from a friend, a would-be actress and musician would record a video for Cox to be considered as Nancy Spungin. While Cox was both impressed with Courtney Love's audition tape and her moxie, the producer financing the $4 million movie wasn't too keen on having two nobodies as the title characters. Cox would, at the advice of the producer, hire Chloe Webb, an American actress who had appeared on the American television shows like Remington Steele and the mid-1980s sitcom Mary, starring Mary Tyler Moore, to play Nancy, but Cox would write a new character for Love, one of the couple's New York chunky friends. Love would also be cast in a leading role in Cox's next movie, Straight to Hell, but that's another story for another episode. The rest of the cast would also be filled with lesser-known actors, including Xander Berkeley and Repo Man co-star Cy Richardson, as well as a small cameo from Iggy Pop, whose title song for Repo Man would help energize the sales of that movie's soundtrack and make Iggy cool again. The production would spend five weeks filming in late 1985 in London, Paris, New York City, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and Cox would spend the first part of 1986 editing the film in London with his editor, David Martin. His producer, Eric Fellner, who would later go on to create working title films, the production team behind Four Weddings and a Funeral, The Hudsucker Proxy, Dead Man Walking, and The Big Lebowski, would ask Cox to have a semi-final cut ready in March in the hopes of getting the film accepted into the Cannes Film Festival. It would be accepted into a particularly strong director's fortnight program, which also included new films from such directors as Chantal Ackerman, Denny Arcan, Marco Bellocchio, and two new American filmmakers, Lizzie Orden and Spike Lee. While there would be no prizes given specifically for the director's fortnight program, Cox and his film would get some exceptional reviews from critics, and the American distribution company Samuel Goldwyn would snatch up the U.S. rights shortly after the end of the festival, in early May. The film's next stop would be its North American premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival in September, where again, the film would ride another wave of positive reviews. And Goldwyn would set the film for an October 17th release at the 57th Street Playhouse in Midtown Manhattan and the Metro Theater in Westwood, just a few blocks south of the UCLA campus. Also opening in theaters on October 17th was the actual first release of the re-edited Jim Wynoski movie Killbots, under its better-known title, Chopping Mall, Martin Scorsese's The Color of Money, the creepy Klaus Kinski horror film Crawl Space from Empire Pictures, a Helen Mirren Tom Conti comedy called The Gospel According to Vic, The Quest, a Brian Trenchard Smith family adventure film with Henry Thomas of E.T. fame, and a comedy called Weekend Warriors the only film to be directed by game show host and occasional actor, Burt Condy. But, again, the film would write a wave of great reviews, including a proclamation from Roger Ebert on the Joan Rivers talk show that Oldman deserved to be nominated for Best Actor, but wouldn't because Hollywood will not nominate an actor for portraying a creep, no matter how good the performance is, would earn an incredible $73,000 in its first three days from those two theaters the highest per-screen average of any film nationwide that weekend. Audiences not only responded to the performances of Oldman and Webb as Sid and Nancy, but also to Roger Deakins' phenomenal cinematography. If you know the film or its poster, you know that Deakins' shot of Sid and Nancy kissing in an alley against a trash dumpster as garbage falls around them in slow motion, along with the recreation of Vicious's video for his version of My Way, became two of the most iconic and indelible images of 1980s cinema. The film would slowly roll out to theaters throughout the remainder of 1986, never playing on more than 60 screens on any given weekend. Goldwyn was hedging their bets somewhat, hoping for a few major nominations from the film critics groups, which would lead to maybe an Oscar nomination too. But despite wins for Chloe Webb for Best Actress from the National Society of Film Critics and the Boston Society of Film Critics, and a nod to Oldman from the Evening Standard British Film Awards as the most promising newcomer of the year, Roger Ebert's prediction would prove true. The Academy did not give the film a single nomination. 
Shortly thereafter, Goldman would wind up the theatrical run of the film with a respectable $2.8 million in ticket sales. It is estimated the film made another $8 million in ticket sales worldwide, giving the production company a small profit once all the receipts were in. I still have the original Criterion Collection DVD of the film from 1998, and I still watch it regularly. One thing I do wish I still had was the original movie poster from the film. I remember the day Goldman sent the poster to my theater in Santa Cruz. Sid and Nancy was not a film we would normally play at the Del Mar. It was more of a Nickelodeon movie. And indeed, the film would play at the Nick starting Christmas Day of all days. Knowing we would not play this movie, I asked my boss Joe if I could take the poster. He didn't know anything about the movie and said I could. Now, most movie posters at the time were made on not very thick paper stock, and the images were just sort of printed on top. What made the Sid and Nancy poster different was that the paper stock was easily twice as thick as regular movie poster paper. The entire poster was covered in a matte black finish, and the lettering of the movie title was done in gold foil. Today, a used original Sid and Nancy movie poster, even with some minor dings, surface blemishes, and edge wear, can still command three to $500 on the internet if you can even find one. Being the broke-ass young adult I was in the late 80s and early 90s, I would sell my perfectly preserved poster to a movie poster store in Hollywood for something like $200 at the time. It was one of the very few times I regretted selling one of my posters out of my collection. Sadly, Alex Cox would never achieve the career he should have, but his films are unforgettable. On an upcoming episode, I'll talk about his straight-to-hell films, yes, films, as well as his most epic movie from the decade, 1987's Walker, in which he would team with stars like Ed Harris, Peter Boyle, Garrett Graham, and Marley Matlin to tell the story about an American soldier of fortune in 1853 who invaded Nicaragua and made himself president. It's an amazing story and an amazing film, and a damn shame that it got buried by Universal Studios. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again soon. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for Idiosyncratic Entertainment. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>